We are live, The Artful Painter, technology for artists. Uh, this, this episode is going to be video for artists, AMA, Ask Me Anything. And the me in this particular episode is filmmaker Joe Hawkins. Joe, great to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Well, this is, this is fun. I, I first heard of you through Matt Ryder, an artist that I had on the Artful Painter podcast. And what got me interested in him is I saw a video that you had shot <laughs> that featured him. And I said, oh, i got to have him on the show. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he, he told me about that experience. It was pretty exciting. Yeah, well, actually, that was the same, the same time I heard about you because he forwarded me the link. Oh, nice. To that podcast and said, oh, by the way, we... Uh, we spoke about you a little bit on this and just give it a listen. And I just gave it a listen anyway, because it was, it was Matt. Well, where, where are so, you located? Uh, in the minute I'm in Yorkshire. You know, I got chastised the other day by somebody. Because I, I used Yorkshire, like we say here in Atlanta, Georgia. And they said, no, 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 it's Yorkshire. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. no, I blew it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, nice. Yeah. Well, I'm in Yorkshire, but originally from Leicester. Yeah. Okay. See, I would have I would have mispronounced that too. I, I just would have not. Leicester. Yeah, I would have not got <laughs> it right. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been filmmaking, Joe? Uh, I started in 2013, so that's seven years now. And um, yeah, seven years. Nice. You know what? I'm going to see if I can get. I want to see what's going out on the live stream here. I should have had this up on my, there it is. Got it. Just making sure. Of course, now it's playing a political ad. Sorry about that. No <laughs> politics on this <laughs> this live stream. Hey, just just before we get into this, uh, of course, this is, uh, we're, we're going to answer your questions. If you have any, if not, if not, Joe and I are going to talk about filmmaking for, for artists. And there's a couple of areas that we could cover on that. And that's, uh, the idea of branding, you know, having a, a bio or an about me video uh, about the artist, I think those are highly effective. They're one of the first things I will go see. And then there's also the idea of doing it yourself, doing training tutorials. Many artists do that as well. So I thought I'd go into that. But I have some great news about The Artful Painter. I've got two episodes of the podcast coming up. One is uh, another thing that I got chid chided for was, <laughs> I got chided for not featuring watercolor artists on the Artful Painter. So I have one and it's a blast. Alex Hilkertz, who is from Paris, France. And I just see Morris Jensen. Uh, he just popped in. He says, hello from France. Cool. <laughs> it's good to see oh, you again, cool. Morris. He's been on before. Yeah. Oh, really nice. So, yeah, I'm going to be interviewing someone in your backyard, Morris. Uh, Alex Hilkertz. That should be coming out sometime next week. And let's see here. We got uh, Dennis Albertson. Hi from Indiana. Hey. Hey, Dennis. Appreciate you joining the show here. So uh, we're going to uh, we're going to be talking to Joe Hawkins. He's in, as I've, I've been corrected in the way to pronounce this, Yorkshire, England. <laughs> <laughs> Remarkable filmmaker. Remarkable filmmaker. Uh but we'll get into that in a minute too. Uh, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to tell everyone about the Artful Painter podcast. I've also lined up uh, Dan McCall. I'll be recording that interview tomorrow morning. Uh, he's one of my favorite artists, one of my favorite books that I've ever bought about uh, the creative process. So it's going to be exciting to talk uh, to Dan. So I look forward to sharing that in a future episode. So let's get into it. So as I mentioned, this is, uh, this is Joe, uh, filmmaker. You have... Uh, some of your clients include companies that many artists will recognize, such as Rosemary & Co. Can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with Rosemary? Yeah, so um, I was initially actually, um, it was through Michael Klein when I was with East Stokes. Um, obviously, he used their brushes, and uh, we got sort of put in touch. I was put in touch with Simi at Rosemary & Co., and they asked if I could come over to help their guys um, get better at filming. They'd made some videos and they were 
fine, but they just wanted to get a bit better. So Michael put them in touch with me and being as I was from England, I ended up going back there, um, A, to see my family and then B, to help those guys get better at making video. Um, and whilst I was back there, initially, it was just a case of teaching them basics. They were kind of like graphic designers and then we got into dead photography and then filming. And so whilst I was there, we made a load of videos for their workshops that they host. Uh, they do like spotlight pieces on the artists that come to them. And we just try to give everyone a bit of a flavor of what the workshops are like. Uh, so we follow the groups out where they paint and stuff. And then we put together like a three minute promo video really. And then after that we did, I wanted to do a video on Rosemary because as I think I found out afterwards, no one had actually ever filmed Rosemary, um, like doing making brushes and no one had ever done it. So whilst I was there, I just sort of said, I'd really like to make a, a, a short documentary piece about yeah. Rosemary, how she started and how we got into it. And then that's where the Rosemary Co video sort of came from. I, I shot it with the two guys at Rosemary Co. They helped as well. And it was very much like we all went into a room and they had cameras. I had a camera and then I edited the oh, whole piece wow. together. Yeah. Hey, well, I tell you what, let me just show a, a little clip from that, that documentary. It's, it is beautiful. If you haven't seen it, I just want to show you just a little bit of that. Let me see if this will work here. It's a creativity of me being able to manufacture and make something from start to finish. And when they pick up our brushes with my name on the handle and they start to paint with it, I love it when I hear them say, this has changed my life. And I like to think now that I've given them a tool they can't blame. And it's amazing to see how their art changes. They're not just picking up a brush anymore. They're picking up an extension of their arm, an extension of their eye, of their vision. And I really feel strongly that I've actually tried to create some magic. <laughs> and I think you created some filmmaking magic there. <laughs> that was, that's so beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's in, the, I think half the time... Well, all of the time, it's like 80% location with videos. You, you can make the best video in the world, but if you're filming it in a concrete block, it's going to look horrible. So filming at that, at their property with their gardens and in their setup, it was so much of it's done already. You just then got to pick out the right shots and then at the end of it, tell the right story, obviously. But, you know, when the location's like that, it's so... It's there's so many things you look in every single direction. There's a shot everywhere you look. There's a shot. So just keep rolling. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things. Uh, so I've watched several of your of your uh, films. Um, one thing I've noticed that I really like. It reminded me of an art. Uh, well, a director of photography I met many years ago. His name is Art Howard. He would shoot for Discovery Channel and, and places like that. And he, he mentioned two things. He says the responsibility of the camera guy, the deep uh, the director of photography, is to show something from a vantage point that most of us don't really have the opportunity to do. He would dig these trenches in the ground so he could shoot at, at ground level, for example, or be in a helicopter or whatever. But the other thing he, he said was, uh, you know, get in close. You want to get in close. And that is something I noticed with yours. You, you you take that camera and you move us right in, like when she's putting the brushes together. I like that because that really show gets me deep into the process. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the film has to become every single viewer's eyes. Like, you have to almost preempt what everyone's going to want to see because you can be on a wide and then you're going to have to sort of at some point think, when do we want to go in close? Um, which is why that whole sequence of Rosemary at the table making the brushes, there's that kind of wide shot by the window and then it's straight in to the, the detail. And the whole point of the video is making brushes. So you need to show making brushes. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to lose. Duh. <laughs> yeah. It is usually it's that 
it's got to be that simple. Like, what's the point of the video? That's what you need to show, kind of thing. Yeah, when you think about a film, you you're also thinking about the who who is this for? Who's the audience for this mm-hmm. film? So, and, and I think we as artists we're, we're kind of divided because some of us want to sell. Well, I think all of us want to sell our, you know, be able to make a profit off of what we do. Yeah. But a lot of what we're selling is not to collectors. It's also to to fellow artists. So there's a divided, um, we're divided as to who our audience is. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've noticed <laughs> with artists, uh, I've noticed a lot of artists, they'll, they'll hold stuff back, they'll hold work back that they're quite attached to. Um, yeah. And it's usually like their, be- their best pieces are the ones that they end up not really wanting to part with. Um, but yeah, I've seen that a lot. There's definitely two audiences. Yeah. So as a director, when you're directing a film with an artist, uh, how do you determine what the needs of that artist are, what, what they want to communicate? Um, that's a good point. It's, it's, it's difficult because it's difficult and yet it's easy. Mm-hmm. The whole thing that interested me in the first place about filming an artist was there's always a painting that everyone has seen. There's, everyone's seen the finished painting and because that's what you take the pictures of. That's what goes in the gallery or wherever you show it on your website. You show the finished piece. No one ever sees what went into it, ever. And the amount of work that they've had to put into it, those days of when it's not quite at work and you maybe had to walk away from the from the easel or the days where you just suddenly you've made so much progress it was the best day ever. Um, and those tiny little details that you add in at the end, or even maybe that it's changed throughout the painting and you've completely changed the painting. All of those things happen when people are painting. <laughs> and it's that kind of thing that interested me, that we all get to see the same end product, but no one ever gets to see the process of it. So whenever I'm talking to an artist, I ask them if they have anything in their, pro- what's their process? I ask them to like, tell me their process. And it is remarkably different with every single artist. Like the three that I can name you straight off the bat, Jeff Larson um, paints everything under natural light, doesn't do anything from photos, uh, and literally will just climb to the top of a mountain to paint the picture. Like he doesn't care, he'll just go and do it. Um, Matt is a, he'll Matt go out Ryder, to Dubai. Yeah, yeah Matt Ryder. He'll go out into the deserts, um, do a study, then bring it back and do it in the studio. And then you've got Henrik, who will paint a huge piece and then throw turps on it. And it's like, I know that's bizarre. I, I saw that. I said I've never seen that done before, at least not intentionally. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. When he first did it, I was like wow okay you just got it he just went over it and just threw it on and i was like wow okay yeah. it's gonna look good visually it was quite a relief for me because you know there's only so many ways you can film a paintbrush on a on a canvas and it, sometimes it's quite nice to see somebody doing it completely differently which is what henry did he just did it so different it was kind of cool to be able to capture that you know what? Let me let me. Uh, you mentioned uh, Jeffrey La- uh, Larson. He's a remarkable artist. Uh, just opened up a, a while back uh, an atelier mm-hmm. in Minis- Minnesota, I believe it was Duluth. Duluth. Yeah. yeah, in an old church <laughs> that he bought <laughs> and renovated. <laughs> wow, he was Absolutely. determined. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, let's see here. <laughs> Morris says Joe's talking like he's been in my studio looking over my shoulder. You're busted, Morris. <laughs> but you know what? You're not really busted. That is what I think collectors are interested in. They want to know the story of the artist. They want to know the struggle and the uh, not the struggle in the Van Gogh <laughs> Van Gogh me, me. But you know, they want to know what you're going what it took for you to get there. I think they want to see that story. So yeah, yeah. Let me uh, let me uh, g- show this uh, trailer. I'll play the whole thing. It's only about a minute long, but this is the this is the trailer to uh, Jeffrey Larson. 
It's about an hour-long documentary. It's beautifully shot. It's an excellent story. It's really heartwarming. And I think any artist that watches this can really identify with it. So let's see if I can get the right clip up here. There we go. I get encouraged the, the tough times. Living on the edge of frustration is where you will learn what you need to know in life. If, if you're comfortable, you don't learn anything. I never got into this for the money. In my mind, I don't have a choice. I have to do this, which is strange, and I don't know that I understand it. There are much fewer painters working in what Jeffrey refers to as classical realism. The realist movement didn't die. People think it did. Well, it didn't die. It's been there. I don't think you can do it on your own as an artist. I really think behind every successful artist, there's someone that's right beside them, supporting in every way possible. Where you are and where you want to be, you never get any closer. Wow. <laughs> uh, such, a, such a beautiful film. He's a remarkable artist, too. He's a phenomenal painter. Like that guy, he also paints like a boxer. Paint like a <laughs> boxer. He, yeah. Yeah. He'll feel himself getting tired and he'll feel himself and his eyes are starting to go tired. So he'll start to do like short, sharp breaths and he'll start to like and start to psych himself up. And, and, and then he'll start, he'll dash in, do a paint, and then he'll dash back. And it, it was like, wow, this, he was so physical when he was painting. It was, it was great. Um, but yeah, he's such a good painter. How did that uh, documentary come about? It was through um, when I was I filmed with uh, East Oaks out out in America. Um, we did some like tutorials and live streams and stuff, and we kind of wanted to do something different. And I felt like I needed to do something a bit creative. Tutorials are great, live streams are awesome. Everyone gets to learn, but it was very much like set the cameras up, leave it. And so I was like, I need an outlet. I need to do something. And they said, if it could do anything, what would it be? And I was like, I, I would love to make a documentary. So we'd featured Jeff in a tutorial in a year before. So we'd gone out in the summer and we'd done a live stream at Jeff's place and we did a tutorial with him and he did a painting and we, and he sat and he told us, what I now nickname the $20 bill story. Um, which That's an amazing of, story, yeah. Yeah, it's the halfway point of the film. I won't tell the story. No, no spoilers, man. <laughs> he sat around this table and he told us this story. And I was just like, we have to make a film of this guy because that is insane. And at that point, we sat in his school and what they're doing, what they've been doing and Every day he would come in and he was like, what are we doing today? Where are we filming? Where are we going? And I'd just basically say, what have you got? And he'd take me out. And so we went there in the summer and I just thought it would be great to go out. And we did a three minute video on that one, just a three minute one, just about summing him up really quick. And I said, his story just needs to have so much time put into it. I want to make an hour long documentary on Jeff. So we went back in the winter and that was perfect. We didn't plan it. But what happened was because Jeff paints in the summer and the winter and he changes how he paints. We had both seasons shot on camera and we had Jeff out in the summer and we had him in the winter in the studio. So we put it all together. And yeah, so it was two full weeks of filming. And then it was about a month. Solid editing. Um, and then yeah, it, it it came out. I'm so proud of that. It came out awesome. Yeah, I, th I think you have every reason to be. It's just a marvelously done film. I And I think uh, he probably feels the same way. I just saw a Facebook post that he made. So <laughs> it, That's always a good feeling when the customer comes back and says, I really like this. <laughs> and I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, <laughs> it's a good yeah. feeling, right? Yeah, it was amazing. He, he called me. I, I sent it to him. And I don't know if you ever get this if you, when you send off, even if it's an art 
piece or like you send off a video there's that horrible bit of limbo you're not hearing from the person you're waiting you just oh i hope he likes it you know that he put he put a lot of time into it so did i but you know then he sat and watched it and then he called me straight after and he was like that was amazing you made me look like a film star <laughs> so which is always job done right <laughs> it's to do, you know yeah <laughs> so yeah and that you know that's my goal with the with the podcast. I want I want uh, the artists to come out being a star. I mean, they already are, but I, I want them to be dignified by the experience. <laughs> and but I do have that pit in my stomach every time I do one. Will they like it? And yeah. uh, I've done forty four episodes so far, forty five. I've not released them all yet, but. Uh, I've only had two episodes where I never heard back from the artists again. Only two. <laughs> and then I wondered, did I do something wrong in those two episodes? <laughs> I don't know. But I got a lot of good feedback from the audience, so that was good. But I, I did. I had two, two people that never even responded. They never even said, yeah, I liked it or anything like that. So that was kind of a weird feeling. But I do get that pit in the stomach because I do want them to be elevated by the experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and also you, you put – you put a lot of time into it and you know it was a month solid month of editing that i put into jeff's thing and so you know you kind of always expect to hear certain things there's obviously jeff straight away was like i think there's a couple of things you might need to change which is fine you know it was like oh okay yeah there's a few things that i maybe put the wrong picture in here or there or whatever but yeah those are constructive those are things yeah you want yeah. that to happen yeah yeah but um you know, when, when they come back and they're just like, I think Jeff ended up watching it like five or six times. He did like a screening at the studio. He did a screening at the school. Mm. Um, yeah, he just, I felt sorry for him in the end. You think he watched it more than I did and I edited it. <laughs> you, you know, uh, I think sometimes they learn something about themselves when they watch those films. I, I had yeah. that happen with, with a documentary I shot uh, two years ago. It was the same response. I didn't know how he was going to take it. And when he watched it, he was in tears. And I said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, you know, it had the effect. It it really touched his heart. He learned something about himself. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you want. You want them to be. Because Jeff, I know for a fact, showing it, anybody who ends up watching it, my intention was just if you're ever feeling down in the dumps, just watch this guy and what he did and how he dealt with it and you'll be fine like you will be fine because look at yeah. how he came out um and i just kind of if anybody took that from it that was great but i think jeff also probably was able to look back and be quite probably proud of himself and as to what he went through was that was that was it a, a documentary is not scripted but you do have a roadmap sometimes of course sometimes you don't know i mean you don't know where the story is going yeah. to go so you got to follow the story and find the story in the process yeah. what was that like as you were shooting uh, his his documentary yeah we had some emails back and forth at the start of it and obviously my roadmap or script mm -hmm. was just life um and i i he was again the typical jeff he wrote down his life story for me and he sent it in an email and then i read it and I went through it and, but, you know, there's always some things that I think I had to be careful. But like, do you want, <laughs> I didn't want to make anybody look bad. No. Yeah. That he didn't want to look bad. And so I would ask him and say, okay, do you want me to, would you mind if I put that in or should, should I focus on that bit? And then it's a case of from that moment when you first read Jeff's life story to the end film you end up going through this filtering process and you filter and you filter and you filter and you filter and then the story was obviously incredibly what I would call baggy at the start in that first edit it was here there and everywhere and and then I I, I just had this light bulb moment one night where I wrote it down on a post-it note and I stuck it on my computer for when I was editing and anytime I got sidetracked I looked at this post-it note and it was basically what makes Jeff stand out from the crowd. And any moment that Jeff had had that I felt made him stand out from the crowd of other artists that I'd filmed, I was like, well, then that stays in, but everything else then goes. And it's amazing how much went then. So you had to leave some of your darlings on the floor. <laughs> That's an old expression from the 
yeah. uh, the film when you were actually editing film years ago. You know, you cut it and drop it to the floor, even though it was the best shot ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and for me, I think to be honest, a lot of it was Jeff's stories. Jeff has a lot of stories, so there's a lot yeah. of stories that didn't make it in. Um, but they were just stories about you know his life and he was traveling and he mm. was young and it was this and it was like that's great but we need it to get to a point in your career and it was all about jeff as an artist it, it had to be that linear um there was a few break offs that we could do but yeah it was it was i was fortunate enough that he'd had a good enough life that we could make a story out of it do you know what i mean yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so many ups and downs in it that it it, it was yeah, it was just too easy not to make it good. But despite those things, it, it was a, a very uplifting film to me. It was very uh, positive, even though they had many struggles to get to yeah. where they were. But I think in that there was a lesson to it. But anyway, no no spoilers on that, but it's it's worth watching. Yeah. I'll provide a link in the show in the show notes after this is over t- so that you can see that. So, yeah, it's it's really great. So one of the things I was struck by as you were describing the editing process, you know, you've got all this material and you get this mishmash (laughs) cut. And I can identify with that. I know what that feels like. (laughs) But there's a similarity with making art. You know, we start off with the basic uh, toning of the canvas and blocking in the shapes and you get this diffuse out of focus thing and then you start moving in and refining the image and then you know you finally get to a point where you say this this is the story so everything else has to leave <laughs> and you yeah. get you get the finished product so that was my forced analogy for the day <laughs> 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 so many yeah. but there are similarities in the in the creative process We're, we humans are very imprecise creatures sometimes <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> So, so uh, I don't have uh, haven't had any questions. So, what I thought I, I'll ask you some questions. So, okay. I think the documentary for Jeff was was incredible. Not all of us have the budget to do an hour long documentary, but but mm-hmm. I think there would be value in doing, you know, a three, four, maybe five minute. Uh, I, well, I hate to put a time stand, a, 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 you know, a, a time limit on that. Whatever is needed to make a short bio that someone can watch on your website you think there's value in an artist doing that yes 100 percent. and obviously everyone's going to say you would say that you're a filmmaker but um the whole thing that led me like i said earlier to artists was this it's like any product you know any, every product has gone through a, a, a making process um you know from just from anything that you could probably physically pick up, it's all been made and there's all a bit of a story behind it. The difference is, is that it, with, a, with a painting or an artist, everything along the way, there's so much um, emotion and there's so much of that person attached to paintings. Like it might be in one painting or it might be in a series of paintings that you've done and it might be about a point in your life that you've tried to express in paintings and stuff. And I do understand that sometimes I think the phrase I would use is you don't want to be too on the nose. Like you don't want to be too obvious with it. Your painting means this and you kind of like to leave it up to people, which I completely agree with. But I think it's also quite nice sometimes for the people to just maybe know a little bit about what went into it. And if you did really work that hard on it, it would be quite nice to show off or you, you've, you've, maybe you've had a job, you've given it up and you started this and now you become a painter and now you're doing this. It's kind of, I always feel like it's going to make people like you more when they, when they know a bit about your story. They're going to straight away probably have a bit more of a, a draw to your work because they, they know you. They feel like they know you more. It's exactly. so much more than a photo. They'll, they'll suddenly be like, oh, they could see your painting in the gallery and then they could tell the person next to them, by the way, did you know that this person went through this, this, this? And they'll be like, no. And like, oh, you should. And straight away, people can start to talk about you. Yeah, and it's, exactly. It's that. <laughs> I, I think about uh, Christine uh, Lashley talking about uh, his her scare with a bear while doing a plein air painting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, that's a lighthearted approach. But that is an interesting story. Now, if you're the owner of that painting, you have an yeah. amazing story that goes with it. And so you as an artist, if you make that story available, and I know for a fact, 
on the Orful Painter, uh, there have been stories show, uh, told uh, that has resulted in a sell for that artist because they got the story. It was somebody that discovered the artist, didn't know anything about it. They listened to the podcast and they said, I want that painting that that person was talking about. And they went and bought it because yeah. they heard the story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I mean, as, as I think as humans, it's not like no one ever knows this. We all know this. We're all attracted to story. Story is like one of the longest running things ever. Everyone loves a good story. And there is a story in anything and everything. And so why not, if you are an artist and you're painting and, and, you, and you're doing it all, why not let people in a bit on it? And you'll find that I think people will probably change their opinion on you. You don't know. So many people can make an opinion just on your Instagram profile. They'll, they'll form an opinion on, of you if they want to. I better but go update you, mine. But, <laughs> but they could. They, they can. can. Just, you're right. Yeah, they can easily look at a picture that you posted and they've gone, oh, look at the brushes that they're using or look at the paints that they're using. They think they're this. And it's, it's could be completely false, but yet. Yeah. It's a curated life, right? It is, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, now, so, you know, the best thing that they could do is, I mean, this is not a commercial for, for Joe or any other filmmaker, but if you do, you're not going to be disappointed, right? If you if they yeah. hire you. But, <laughs> but I mean... Th a lot of times we try to do this stuff ourselves, but I think the value of having someone that has um, uh, filmmaking experience is they know how to extract that story. You know, yeah. let's see here. Morris has got a question. It says the, the problem is for the artist, it's our normal life. It's hard for us to imagine our life is interesting for other people. You know, Morris, you read my mind because that's exactly where I was going with this is I think a lot of us do feel that we don't feel like we've got a story worth telling. But think about this. I think, uh, Joe, if you and I were sitting down at a cafe table sharing a pint, uh, we would have all kinds of stories. And yeah. yet, you know, we probably individually think, yeah, we're, we're kind of dull. <laughs> well, I'm not saying you're dull, Joe, but I know I am. You know, that's the way I feel. But then you start, you couldn't get us to shut up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what, 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 what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think everyone thinks that they're but I think I'm boring um, and I think everyone thinks that it's just their normal life but then it's like well what is normal Jeff didn't think for one minute that there was a documentary in that his words to me were uh, this is true his words to me were I think you should do the documentary but don't do it on me because I'm just not that interested that was Jeff's words to no me. way wait that's what he said <laughs> wow <laughs> And so it was kind of, we did, at that point then, did we did toy with who else did we film? And it was me, and and I was just like, oh, like, I'm sorry, we got a film, Jeff. Like, uh, that, that one story in the middle is all too good, and we'll build it around it, even if it's just that one story. But the thing is, it's not always going to be an hour long, sure. Um, the other way to think of it is it's not just got to be about you. There's another spin you can put on it, which is something that I've been doing now with a couple of artists. I did with Henrik Uldalen and um, Matt not quite didn't do it for that, but he did it to help himself out with a series. I think he was painting and I did it with Michael Klein. And that was when they had a, a show coming mm -hmm. up. They then said, let's do a video on the show, because a lot of the time the show will have an underlying theme. So it's kind of like. All right, that's not about Michael, but it is about Michael's paintings and about right. what he's trying to get. So if you don't think that you're that interesting and maybe you've not had a fight with a bear when you're painting, that's not a problem. Um, but we can still extract something from it and sell your work through it. That's very that nice. You put on it. Yeah. Well, look who dropped in. We've got Rosemary and Co. Artist brushes here. <laughs> says, hi, folks. We have appreciated Joe beyond, uh, beyond for making so many great clips, photos, and a different way of showing our company. So uh, she said, they ask, uh, let me ask you, how can you help artists more? We help with brushes. <laughs> that's, that's a good <laughs> point, right? Mm, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm... 
can only help with with filming, unfortunately. <laughs> well, um, helping us learn how to tell our stories because we do feel like we're we're boring, but yet we're not. We're not. No human is truly boring. They're just not. I've never met. I shouldn't say I never, but it, no, even. Uh, yeah, I'll stick with that. I've never met someone I would consider absolutely boring. I think everyone has a story uh, to be told. And I think with artists, um, we want to get the word out about their work. It's the only way. I mean, if you don't know who they are, how in the world are they going to know that there's this beautiful painting that's going to make them feel good for decades in their home, right? Yeah. And I think also it's kind of like – I. There's so much, there's so many little things that happen when somebody paints. Yeah. But there's, so the, the thing that a painter should never forget is that there are so many people out there that don't have a clue about what it takes to do a painting. Um, and where you say it's normal for us because we're painters, but then at the same time, there's a guy that probably worked, lives down the road that works in a factory that's never even seen you paint before. And if we were to show you out on a sunset, you painting a landscape, he could be like, oh my God, that is absolutely amazing. And he's never seen anything like it before. Mm. Uh, it, you, I think you you should always bear in mind that there's people out there that have never seen you work and have never heard about you and seen you. And it's those people that you want to try and bring, branch out to. Um, not necessarily. To, I know a lot of artists want to be liked by a lot of other artists, and I like want to be liked by a lot of other filmmakers. But it's well, it's that goes really, back to that 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 split audience. You know, we're <laughs> artists are sometimes marketing to artists. <laughs> But they need yeah. to be also marketing to collectors. People, well, I shouldn't say just collect people who love art. That's really, yeah, yeah. I think collectors are a huge. That is it. That should be a big audience for collectors. And let's face it, story is a big selling tactic. Mm -hmm. Telling a story is a huge selling tactic. So if you've got a collector, and you can tell your story to a collector that you think, how can you not buy it after watching this story? then it might even help you seal a deal. You know, it, it could be as simple as that. The, the, the way that I would like you to use films is that if you have one made on you, send it to your collectors. Send it to the people that buy from you, that have bought from you in the past, um, and use it as a tool to help get your images and your paintings out and your story. Exactly. Rosemary and co., uh... They say, uh, yeah, I absolutely, absolutely agree. Joe managed to tell our story. We think we are boring. Now, who, who of us would think that Rosemary & Co. is boring? I've been fascinated from the day I got my first catalog from them. <laughs> There's nothing boring about Rose to me. But see, but that's their perception, right? It says the world is a big place, even though we are also close through just a short message. Isn't that true? That's so cool. Yeah. Or a short video, yeah. I think also that there's another thing for me in when you when I when I made the videos on the artist there was another thing if so there's one side of it that I was talking about with the collectors right that if you want to help it as a sales tactic but it can also be used as a as a like we've already experienced that when I said you have that horrible moment when you first send out the video and you're kind of waiting and you don't know what whether they're going to like it or not yeah and I bet every single artist out there has been through that. The other thing that the videos are good for is to show other artists that they go through the same thing. They could be the biggest artist out there and they'll mm -hmm. go through the same battles as you will. They'll go through the same, they'll rip up paintings, they'll throw them out, they'll turn them around and they'll never see them again. And They all go through the same thing and I think it's quite a nice different way to show people that they're only human and you're only human. and. I just think that's quite a nice spin on it sometimes. So, so Morris offers an interesting uh, challenge that we have when we do it ourselves, okay, making a story. He says, I film myself while painting live on Facebook, but it does change how I paint. It slows me down somewhat, and I tend to waffle. And uh, I, I agree with you, Morris. The same thing happens to me when I try to film. That's, that's why you don't ever see you rarely see a how-to video. Well, not that I'm qualified to do a how-to video, but you will never, you just won't see very many of mine that way. <laughs> Maybe one or two or three, that's it. And I'm not happy with any of them because they do change the way I think when I'm painting. But anyway, what's the answer to this? 
Uh, well, to be honest, if it was made to feel any better, Morris, every artist I've ever worked with, I've done a lot of tutorials. I did it with Theresa Oaxaca, I've done it with Carla Russo, Michael, mm -hmm. Josh LaRocque. You know, I've done it with all of them. They all do that same thing. And they'll all get to a point where they'll turn to me at the end of the second day of filming and they'll say, I can't finish this painting um, because it's slowing me down so much, I can't actually finish it. Um, and then it's a point, it was a case of, in in some situations, it was a case of, okay, we'll just just stop talking and crack on and you get on with it and yeah. paint, we'll film it. And you've, you've probably, I mean, what I did find was when I was editing it, I think you said everything you can possibly say when you're teaching about art, probably within, if you get past the block in stage and then maybe that initial sort of first layer, you said so much that every single layer you do on top of that, you just repeat yourself. So I think that it always gets to a point where I'd say about halfway through your painting, even if it's a tutorial, just stop talking for a bit and just go into it and do a chunk and then maybe recap over the chunk and just be like, okay, so what I was doing there is this. You don't have to constantly talk because it does slow you down because what you do is you start to break down your own process and then you start to start looking at it differently and then you start thinking oh, i never realized i did that and then it becomes this whole thing in your head there's always time to talk before or after right yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah absolutely um but i think that you're multitasking as well so yeah i also say give yourself a bit of a break i mean it's hard it's not easy and then you've got to talk on it it's 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 tricky but um a lot of people have that problem. Yeah, there are some artists that are good at that. They're good performers. Um, and I don't mean that yeah. in, a, in a bad way, but they're able to do that. Pa Patrick Saunders is an artist that I talked to a while back. And I went to one of his demos and he was, he, he really enthralled the audience, but he has practiced it for a long time. It's been part of a repertoire. So he's comfortable with it, but uh, not all of us are, are in, that, in that same uh, situation. Teaching is really difficult, yeah. like really difficult, and painting is really difficult. And I think unless you've got a lot of practice at doing them together, um, you are going to be slower initially. But then, like anything, it's practice. I have to say, probably the best demo I ever filmed was Sean Cheatham. Um, and it was a three-hour live stream demo that we did, and he painted this a la prima portrait. And, but Sean taught in a in a college or mm. this university down the road from every single day and right. he did that yeah. day and he actually finished before the three hours was up and he turned and looked at me and he was like how long have i got left like, you got another 45 minutes left and he was like oh i can just play around with it for a bit longer but he was he had it to such a he, he had like his uniform way of doing it and he knew exactly what to say when and he knew exactly what to do when but it's only because he did it every day and he practiced and he practiced. So, yeah. Well, I mean, let, let me run this by you. I, I, what was going through my mind as you were saying that, I was listening. Don't we do <laughs> That's terrible. We humans are terrible <laughs> when it comes to listening. But you, you did trigger a thought, and I got to thinking. You know, so going back to Morris, for example, or, or any of us, um, a lot of times what we're doing is we've seen YouTube – and what does YouTube have? It has all the how-tos. Okay, how to paint this. Or there's the the painting time lapse. Or, yeah. you know, it's a how-to. It's geared toward uh, the artist. And um, maybe if we changed our focus to, okay, I want to, I would like for this painting to find a home somewhere. Let me, t let me just tell the story <laughs> of this. Yeah. So, instead of focusing so much on the how still show the process like you said you know without um, without the talking as you're doing it just do it <laughs> and then yeah. uh, tell a story that that went behind that yeah i mean i'm sure there's a load of psychological tricks that you could help yourself with these things <laughs> in a way to, ways to, to spin it for yourself to make it easier but yeah i mean there's there's look i mean i would say all of them Bar Sean Cheatham struggled with the whole painting and talking thing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so Morris asked, "Was uh, the Patrick Saunders demo watercolor or oil?" Um, 
it was it was oil, and he did it in two hours. Um, I saw it just before we all got shut down by the pandemic, and it was astonishing. I took several photos of it. I don't know if I shared any from that. I'll have to do that if I didn't on my Instagram. But you see, I think I may have put a couple there, but it was extraordinary. It was just I've never seen anything like it. I've not. I've been to a lot of demos, and they're all good, you know. But this one was, it was different. There was something different about the physicality of how he did it. He was a he was a very much a, a measurer. So I learned that, you know, he was constantly measuring between the source and the, I mean, the reference and and the painting, yeah. and and he was talking the whole time. You know, it was just I, I don't know. Anyway, I got another. Let's see here. I think there was, there's, well, I mean, one more thing I can add to that for yeah. Morris is that there was a, sometimes actually it was the opposite as well that mm -hmm. people struggled. And that was, um, it was basically that they would stop talking and they didn't know what to talk about. Oh. But then, then that was like an opposite thing was yeah. that I've just frozen and I don't know what to say. And if you ever get that issue as well, what I used to say was just say what you're thinking. Like, if you're looking at something and you're thinking about measuring that or determining that, that, just just speak out, think out loud, is what I was basically saying. Yeah, I'm I'm real hungry. What shall I have for lunch? <laughs> <Don't know. laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I hate painting right now. <laughs> uh, David Darrell asks uh, Rosemary and Co. Do you have a link uh, to Joe's videos on you all? I tell you what, I will provide a link. I'm not with Rosemary, but I I do know that many of his videos are on, are on their website. They're also on Joe's website. So we'll provide links to that after the show ends. It'll be a few hours after this video gets processed on YouTube and all that, but I'll, I'll provide that in the links uh, to this show. So also there's a little area on Rosemary Co's YouTube where it's like artist spotlights. You can find some there. I, I did those ones. The artist spotlights. Okay. That's good. Yeah. It's called artist spotlight on their YouTube page. There's like Henrik's on there, Matt Ryder's on there. They, we when we go and film those videos, we do one for Rosemary Co, and then I do one for the artist. So we kind of do two separate interviews, and then I make two videos out of it. Well, there you go. Joe has produced all of our videos. Awesome. <laughs> that's a that's a good endorsement there. Very nice. Yeah. Well, they are beautifully done videos. It's really good. I. It's just been. I think I've watched every single one of them. I believe I have watched every video that's out there. It's just, it's one of my sources of entertainment and education. So I, I enjoy that. So I, I, I was watching your films before I knew who you were, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. Like, hey, I'm bored. Watch the films. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of scary, isn't it, David, when you realize... How did the how did the TV talk back to me? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. But David, I do appreciate you dropping by. It is, yeah. It's uh, I do these live every once in a while. Uh, I've been trying to address technology for artists. I have a technology uh, background, so not an expert by any means. But uh, I want to remove the fear of technology from artists because it can be very overwhelming. Uh, to to build a website, to make videos, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that's that's why we're doing this. And I really appreciate Joe taking the time to do this as well. Let's see, got another comment. This is from, um, oh, yeah. And recently we've done a series of brush cleaning videos and edited them too. We're grateful. We honestly can't recommend Joe enough. You know, I haven't what Now, I lied when I said I watched all the videos. I haven't seen all the brush cleaning. I saw the Quang Ho one. <laughs> Yeah, that was good. <laughs> yeah. We actually got them to. Um, obviously, it was during the lockdown, so we got a load of artists to actually film themselves. Oh, um, neat! And they're all done it on their either their phones, and they've sent me the the footage, and then I've edited it together. So we've got uh, Kwong Ho, Leon Holmes, Susan Lyons, Scott Burdick. Um, oh, that's quite I a lineup. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just so happens that Scott Burdick, who I have met, he actually studied cinematography at university. I didn't um, know that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And so I showed him the Jeff Larson documentary, and, and he's made a few documentaries. And 
I knew he had a camera, so like their their, their brush cleaning video is very well done. Yeah. But you know, um, if you look at Quang Ho's, he's done it on his phone, and Leon Holmes, he's done it on his phone, and he's, I think he's got it on a selfie stick at some points and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, there's no. If you're going to film yourself, I'd say just go for it. Just go for it, and don't worry too much about what everyone else is going to say. Because what kind of tips do you give them when they when they they're faced with that task of having to to shoot video of themselves? Um, I actually put together a a document for the artists hmm. of what to do. Um, first things first, turn your phone landscape. <laughs> Everything looks better wide. None, none of this. None of this. Got to do it like no. this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was a case of little. I tried to keep it simple, but keep it static where you can. Uh, put it on a tripod or a mount. Just keep it um, as static as you possibly can. And then if you do want to pick it up and move it in, then you can do but just try and keep it kind of as steady as possible the, the, it's so hard on a phone because you're used to picking it up and throwing it around everywhere exactly it's hard. Yeah. i actually asked them to do it three times over so i said if you do it as a wide and you're talking and then do it again but do it closer in on your phone and it's work leon holmes nailed it like absolutely nailed it. he actually got i think he had two phones set up at one point so i've got two cameras to choose from and he's showing us where he's mixing and doing stuff so um, yeah, I'd say if you can, if you're making your own videos and they're for a tutorial purpose, keep your phone as still as you possibly can and put it in a place where they can see the most. If you've only got one phone, put it in a place where you can see painting and palette. Because what I learned when I did live streams and tutorials is nobody wants fancy camera moves. Nobody wants sliders or gimbals or anything like that. It just irritates them. <laughs> what they want is to see what are you painting, what are you mixing, and how are you putting it on the canvas. So you can kind of probably do that all with one shot because the iPhones are fairly wide. Um, if not, you could get an iPad to film one and then your phone on, put one on the palette and one on the canvas. It's all about what you want them to see. Think if you were an audience member, think what you'd want to see if you were learning. That's how I thought about it when I was filming and I wasn't an artist and it was always about how would I feel if I was learning to paint what would I want to see right yeah I don't watch artist videos unless they are painting so I never noticed a live emblem it's okay David (laughs) I just have it on in the background for friend noise well I'm glad we're friends that's I like that enjoy the entire discussion thank you yeah and you know what we all have different objectives in doing this. So, yeah, that's cool. That's, yeah. That's, he, he says, I, I do both things better when I'm listening. I hear accurately and I do the other thing with greater focus. ADD has its blessings. Well, that's a very positive outlook of that. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. We're getting some nice, uh, nice, um, Nice feedback here. This is a good question from Lori LaRue. Uh, any audio enhancements on the iPhone? Not, there's probably is, but whether they're any good, I don't know. Um, audio is always going to be a bit of an issue, uh, especially if you're filming it on your phone because it's the speaker on the phone. Um, if I'm honest, I think I did look into this at one point. Now it was about two years ago. We, I looked into if there was a microphone attachment that you could put in. And there you go. Yeah, like that. Yeah, this is from Rode. This is the the SE6 for uh, mobile phones. It actually has an input for two devices going in. It's got a lightning <laughs> conduct, c- connector. The, my phone, my old camera is not autofocusing right there you go. So it's a lightning connector. You can also get one with TRS. Uh, what is it called? TRSS is a special plug that goes into your mobile device. And these things, you can actually get uh, the Boya mics. They sound okay. They're not going to be as good as, uh, you know, a five $600 uh-huh. wireless system. But, you know, if you're just doing it yourself, this is going to improve things dramatically. You can't hardly yeah. see it, but there it is. So uh, a lavalier mic. I mean, if it's road, it's going to be good. Um, 
And I suppose, I mean, I would always recommend Rode. Yeah, I product. think they they make great products. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's cool that they're, they're doing that now. When I last looked into it, it was a pretty uh, sparse market. There wasn't much on there. Right. I think I'd look now more than ever because so many people are having to do live streams now. There's got to be some form of prod- products out there. And if, you, if, you, if maybe that's, I don't know how much that is, but I'm assuming it's fairly affordable. You know, I don't know what the price is of it. I, um, they, they actually, full disclosure here. I, I actually won this thing. I, I don't ever win anything in my life. But I, I, they had this little po- uh, podcast, uh, two minute, do a two minute uh, podcast demo, and so I submitted mine. I didn't actually win the podcast entry, but anyone that entered actually got one of these. So there you go. I didn't. I, so I can't tell you how much it cost, <laughs> but it works pretty good. Uh, that's cool. I bet you there's so many of them on the market now. I I'd recommend getting one, Laurie, because the the, the iPhone's always going to be placed away from you, so it's going to help you like no end. That you don't have to like lean and speak into the camera or anything like that. You can sit back and you know that people are going to hear you. Ah, here's a good one. Can you tell us how you make the sound effects? That's what I find the coolest. What are they talking about? Maybe you must be so smooth we don't even notice it. It's just part of the foley sound or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> well, the sound effects aren't always what's filmed. Yeah. So, um, for example, if you you might know this, Carl. If you shoot slow mo, you don't always get sound. Exactly. Or it's you know it's real low. Yeah. Yeah. If it's and on the you, iPhone, yeah. Yeah, you might speed it up and it's kind of goes quick and it sounds like that kind of hamster noise yeah. sound. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. So with um, with the Rosemary Co. video, there was obviously a lot of sound effects in that. Um, usually what I would actually do is I'd record the sound actually completely separate to the to the to the shot. So there was a the shot that you start with from above the sound effects from that is actually from a different shot okay and it's just timed into it and then i just look at the movements of it and then just try and match it up where i can um in another example there's a video i've just worked on but it's for a restaurant so sorry to that's okay everybody here. It's the, not to do with paint. food is art too yeah so i just did a rest uh, uh it was a michelin star restaurant and um, I shot a lot of it in slow-mo, so when I came back, I didn't have a lot of sound, but I wanted sound in it. So I actually you know, just recorded myself doing it in the kitchen <laughs> and um, and put it in that way. Uh, and so you, you, are you, can, you can get sound effects online as well. You can buy them, like you can buy music. People record them, and they put them up, and then you can pay for them, or... Um, do them yourself. Like I put the microphone next to me in the kitchen. I chopped up an onion and it worked great. <laughs> See, I, that's what I do a lot. I, Cause there's a lot of little things you can just record yourself and, and it's not like you're yeah. playing them at full volume They They actually sit in the mix so that it's just a, it's a part of the ambience there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Who do you yeah. like? One, th- one thing I want to mention on this, sometimes I get questions about uh, licensing music. Um, you know, I do both a podcast and YouTube video, so you have to be real careful about li- licensing, making sure that the license for those products cover both uh, distribution on YouTube and Vimeo and other uh, video downloads, but there's also uh, podcasts. M- most of the services don't license for podcasts. It's only for YouTube. And I say, oh, <laughs> so I have to be real careful with that. But that's a, I digress. I went down a rabbit hole there. Let's see. And then the light on. What's that? Oh, they asked me to turn the light on. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I should have been alert to that. <laughs> That's right. It's it's uh, It was about 7 o'clock your time when we got yeah. started. I, I, I got it. <laughs> Thank you, Rosemary. Appreciate that. <laughs> There goes my video production credibility out the window right there. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> yeah, we're getting progressively darker here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you, David. We really appreciate that. He says, a very interesting discussion, gentlemen. Thanks. Uh, Morris says, please add a link to that mic. Uh, I will do that, Morris, afterwards. Uh, give me a few hours before that, that goes live, but I'll, I'll be glad to do that. Lori says, got, thank you. I've got one tip. Great. Let's hear it. And this was all, this is such a thing that I never came across until I filmed artists. And it is, how do you get rid of glare on a painting when you're photographing it? Yes. And here's the tip. Try and, if, you, if, you, if you're taking a picture of your painting, um, and whether you've got it lit artificially or lit by a window, um, what usually happens is if you look at the painting, you'll see the glare come on and you'll notice from the angle that it's not happening. Um, it's usually to do with all the angle of reflection and things like that, which we won't go into on this because right, it's very yeah. exciting. Point. But if you can get a black sheet of material and put it behind the camera, what that does is it stops all of the bounce happening. So no matter where you put your camera, you might have to move the sheet around a bit, but just keep moving it around until that glare disappears. Because what black does is it stops all of the reflection and the bounce happening. So just set up, you get yourself a big black sheet and set it up. I've often found that it's from behind the camera that way, because it's the angle of the camera to the light. Gotcha. That's what so you're setting it up behind the camera. Yeah. And the art's the in front of it like this. Your camera's here. Yeah. The black is behind you. Yeah. And so usually you'd set that up and immediately you'll notice that there is a, the glare goes, it will go because usually it's the light. If the light and the camera are at a certain angle to the painting, you're always going to get glare. It's going to happen. It's a physics law. So cancel it out and just put a big load of black up behind your camera and it will disappear and you will never have glare again. Very good tip. Yeah, just eliminate the the extraneous light sources yeah. like that. Excellent. Yeah. I, I've seen that done in, um, in in one artist studio. That's exactly what they did. So I think that's an yeah. excellent tip. Let's see. David asked about uh, TR, TRRS. Yes. <laughs> As, so the phone, the iPhone, and I think uh, most Android devices are too, is TRRS. So it'll it'll look, well, I'm doing a terrible job showing you here, but It'll have one, two, three, four poles with three, you know, be three lines of uh, insulation between each one of those little connectors. So, and this is, this is a TRRS to TRS adapter because most <laughs> stereo devices come with it. Uh, <laughs> and if I'm wrong, you just, you all signed a, a, a colossal disclaimer before you came into this live stream. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness okay he says um uh, they say uh, let's see here i must be honest before we had joe join us on board i thought the videos and photos were we pro uh, we produced would cost a fortune i think you would agree the way joe shoots make you think it's expensive brilliant exactly they do look expensive they are uh uh yeah and that's what you want want to do. You want it to look like a million bucks. How do you do that, yeah. Joe? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Now we're not <laughs> saying he's cheap. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's so that would then be the difference uh, from you making it on your phone to then me shooting it and coming in on my equipment because it's not a phone it's a camera and it's made to look awesome because that's what, <laughs> what cameras are doing um but the my intention with every film that i make is to make every film better than the last one and then push it in ways that i think are cinematically interesting i have a maybe a style that's cinematic and it's not you know, like there's a difference between reality TV and a film that you'd go and watch. It's different. It's shot differently. Um, I love films, and I think that even if it is a documentary about someone, it should look like a film, not like reality TV. So it's usually the filmmaker's style. So if you're looking for a filmmaker, 
look at the style of their look at their previous work do they have a certain look to it do you like the look of it because chances are they're going to film yours that way and so i think i've been lucky that the people that i've been able to film live in very amazing places and awesome locations i mean look at matt ryder's videos it's out in the middle of a desert in dubai um the sunsets and all that kind of stuff it's gonna look great and then it's a case of making it look cinematic and that's just a case of of, of knowing your craft really it's like exactly. how does a painter make his art look good it's a case that i've i spend a lot of time reading up on stuff how do i make things better i always want to make things better so you're only as good as your last video and if <laughs> And that's why I like to live by, basically. So. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's clearly, there is a difference. I mean, these type of videos where we're live streaming, quality is not really uh, a huge factor. I mean, we want it to be as good as possible. Um, yeah. But it's not going to be the same where there's deliberate thought. And I think artists, we as artists, we can feel the same way. I mean, we feel the same way about our art. We want to show our best. Uh, I even use that phrase with some paintings that they, they have a cinematic feel, and I think it's because they follow the, the, uh, you know the, they have good concept, they have good good design, they have uh, beautiful aesthetics when it comes to their aspect ratios and and their composition and and that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not always going to look. Not every video is going to look the same, and you need to kind of get on board with that pretty quick. Like if this video is this. I don't know. Matt's looks good in widescreen, but someone else might look looks good completely different. Sure. And it's understanding that, and that when you when when it comes to paying someone for a video, that is what you're paying them for. You're paying them to make you look as good as possible, and they will use all of their tricks and tools that they've got to do it. Exactly. Can you give artists some hope in how they can either uh, a film themselves and be affordable, or b can you edit their films to help with your touch? I mean, yeah. To, to I think the, the the biggest tip I can give to film yourself is take your time. <laughs> Don't rush it because even as a filmmaker, the biggest thing that I you always want is more time. Um, but if you're filming yourself, there's no one else that you're gonna be delaying other than yourself anyway <laughs> so take your time on it um if you do go wrong reshoot things or keep it still keep it static keep it nice compose your shot if you're an artist composition's a huge thing like make it look nice yeah and an artist is going to understand composition aren't they i mean it's really not any not much different with video <laughs> It's not, look, I mean, I know for a fact that all of my favorite cinematographers are all inspired by painters. Yes. Uh, a lot of the looks of films are inspired by a painter and their color palette and the palettes that they use to paint are the colors that they use in the films. So if you do happen to have a really nice camera and you want to start filming with it and you want to film yourself with it, look at some of your favorite paintings and look at how the light is in that painting and copy it. The best way to teach yourself initially, I always think, is to just copy. If You know, like Vermeer's got this great way of putting light in at an angle coming down. So I liked it, and therefore I was like, I'm going to use that. I'll put that in some of my shots. And then it's a case of playing and repeating and doing and doing. And the, the more you do it, the more you learn. Make a load of mistakes that's how you learn quick. <laughs> You'll never do it again, especially when it comes to filming and digital stuff because you lose it or it goes or it corrupts and you'll have a breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have to start wrapping up, but I, th I think there's a good point here. Um, uh, would you ever do live streaming to help an artist get online and reach their audience? Lots of hard artists need help with this. I agree. I think um, that's one of the reasons why I invited you on this is I think there's a, a tremendous need for messaging um, and, and, and learning how to up our video game uh, yeah. when it comes to our art. Yeah, and I mean, well, I mean, my camera right now is just on my iMac and Carl, your camera to me looks very clear and we're in two different countries. 
Are you yours on a computer or is yours on Actually, a uh, I'm using a DSLR. I've got a Canon. Uh, I got. In fact, it's an old <laughs> camera. Is like 10, 10 years old. It's an old Canon 5D Mark II USB cable coming into Ecamm Live, which is um, a great way to get that you know blurry background where you're yeah. separated from the background a little bit. It's great for this. And there many, many modern uh, DSLR cameras do this, whether they're mirrorless or DSLR. Yeah. And then it's a case of looking for your platforms. And like you just said, there, there's Ecamm Live. There's a lot of different ones. There's Sling Studio um, for your higher end stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, if anybody has any questions about how to do live streams or if you wanted any tips or tricks or anything throughout the way, then yeah, please feel free. I'll I'll help you if I can. Because um, what's the best way for them to get get in touch with you, Joe? Uh, email. Okay. Would be um, Joe Hawkins Films, all one word, at gmail dot com. Okay. And that that's also available on your website, which is uh, let me get it up here. I had it in your lower thirds. Um, if I can remember where it is. See, I'm I'm learning how to do this too, folks. We're in it together, okay? There we go. <laughs> jhfilms.org. And uh your your uh, contact information is there, and I'll make sure that there's a link uh to that as well. He has a beautiful website, folks. I encourage you to go check that out. It's uh very nicely done. A lot we can learn. And Joe, you've been extremely helpful today. I uh, really appreciate all our guests dropping in, Rosemary and Co. It's very nice to have you here, Morris, David, Lori. <laughs> uh, uh, you made for a lively discussion. Really good, uh, really good questions. So I appreciate that. So Joe, thanks, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna end it right here. Go out there and paint or film something amazing. <laughs>